You're listening to Frontlines, a podcast for the people that truly make mountain biking happen. Not the riders, racers, or product designers, but the builders, advocates, and the often forgotten board members of your local mountain bike trail association. Welcome to episode nine of Frontlines. I'm your host, Brent Hillier. First off, I'd like to apologize for the delay in getting this episode out. On the personal front in my life, there's been a lot of changes, and my wife and I are very excited to announce the birth of our son. As those of you who are parents can understand, and those who aren't can probably imagine, there's been a lot of change and excitement in our lives. While I work on a couple of new episodes, I wanted to fill the void with a short episode, introducing a new topic. After episode 6, I received a fantastic voicemail, and I tried to get it into the following episode, but it just didn't really fit. I also thought that it deserved its own episode, as it was a topic that I think can be really expanded on. Before going any further, I'll let you have a listen. Hey Brent, it's Steve from uh, Charlotte, North Carolina. I recently discovered your podcast, and uh, episode 6 was actually the first one I listened to. I found the discussion about uh, inclusiveness, or lack thereof, and uh, diversity to be pretty interesting. I would argue that there's another variable, which doesn't get mentioned very often, that holds back diversification, and that's the local bike shops. I would imagine that before a new cyclist uh, makes its way to a local trail center or group ride, they're probably going to a local bike shop or two. To give you some background, I'm a 42-year-old white guy. Um, I've been mountain biking since 1996 and to be honest I find the vast majority of local bike shops to be unwelcoming elitist places that have little or no interest in actually helping the customer find what they need to enjoy cycling. Like I said I I live uh, near Charlotte North Carolina where both mountain biking and road cycling are very popular and uh, within about a 10 minute drive of my house there's half a dozen locally owned bike shops and I to be honest don't feel comfortable going to any of them for advice. I find them to be staffed or owned by people who would rather talk in acronyms and jargon and insult you than try to help or educate you. Um, I can't imagine how I would feel if I didn't have 20 years of mountain biking and bike buying experience to kind of fall back on and tell if they're trying to take advantage of me. Same thing was true during the 15 years that I lived in Indianapolis, Indiana, so I know it's not an isolated issue to where I live now. Just to give you an example, I recently spent about $500 for a new mountain bike for my 10-year-old son. I did quite a bit of research and realized that the most important thing you can do when you're trying to get a young rider into biking is to minimize the weight of the bike. Uh, Since my son only weighs about 70 pounds, minimizing the weight of the bike was important. And after researching all the bikes within my budget, I found that uh, a Novara mountain bike, which is um, REI's private label, and that bike weighed about 28 and a half pounds, uh, which is about two pounds less than I could find from anything else kind of in that price range. You know, two pounds is a big deal when the bike weighs about 40% of your body weight. And um, I couldn't imagine riding a 70 pound bike on single track so i know how minimizing weight for my son would be important after he got the bike the one thing my son didn't like was the shifters on the bike and he asked if we could replace them with kind of the rapid fire shifters so um, i asked at rei and found out that they didn't have the parts in stock to do what i needed so i took his brand new bike to one of my local shops and explained exactly what i wanted to do and made the salesperson aware of you know that i was willing to spend some money to get done you know what i wanted to get done and the reaction was totally unexpected. Instead of helping me figure out the best options and the best parts and, and figure out you know, a good solution, I was kind of berated for buying quote unquote such a crappy bike and then was told that nothing can be done to make the bike rideable and you should just sell it and buy something better. So at that point, the guy turns and starts showing me you know, $700 plus Trek kids bikes that they had for sale. Obviously knowing that this was, you know, complete crap. I turned and left the store frustrated and you know I haven't been back to that store since. Also once I was witness to a situation in a shop in, in Indianapolis. I was picking up my bike from being serviced and a African-American father brought his daughter in along with her bike that had a flat tire and they asked the tech if uh, they could get help fixing the fixing the flat tire. The tech immediately went into sales mode trying to sell them a new bike and he did this before he even checked to see what was wrong whether it was the tube or the tire and he was telling them that it wasn't worth spending any money to fix her quote old bike. 
I found this to be incredibly insulting, you know, to tell a customer and, you know, especially in front of their child that the bike they have isn't good, you know, and to make them feel inferior, um, you know, I would imagine would pretty much upset anyone and could prevent them from enjoying, you know, riding whatever bike they have. So, you know, in your other podcast, I know you, you explored all the other variables. And I think that maybe one of the biggest impacts that some of the large bike manufacturers could have would be to work with their dealer networks to make sure that the local shops are welcoming and accommodating and respectful of, you know, whoever comes through the front door asking for help and advice. If people feel excluded in a shop, they're never going to make their way to a group ride or to the trails or, you know, to an advocacy meeting. So I would really encourage the local shops to save the jargon for the serious cyclists and keep it simple for the beginners and novices and the weekend warriors. You know, being a welcoming, respectful and patient to the customer is going to make them feel a lot more comfortable. And you might not sell a brand new bike that day, but you might help get a person into cycling and you know, maybe get a, a customer in the long term. So again, thanks for uh, putting the podcast together. I really enjoyed it and um, I'll be listening. Thanks. Thanks for that, Steve. I think Steve brings up a great point. Mountain biking and cycling is a complex activity. The learning curve is quite steep and the purchase of a bicycle itself can be complex. A new cyclist can easily be overwhelmed. I had an opportunity to experience a similar situation when purchasing a new stroller. I walked into a local department store, unsure of price points and details. I discovered that what I was looking for was not simply a stroller, but a travel system. And for those unaware, that's a stroller and a car seat combo that your child can grow into. It includes a base plate for your car, a carrier for your child when they're an infant that can connect to the stroller. Without the carrier, the stroller will fit your child once they are a toddler. Armed with this new understanding of what I was looking for, I now discovered that within this category, the options were huge. Plastic wheels versus inflated tires, three versus four wheels, and all sorts of bells and whistles for both child and parent. My wife and I then left the department store to start shopping around. We found ourselves in a boutique baby store looking at strollers that were priced closer to the $1,000 range. And unlike the $300 stroller at the department store, these strollers didn't come with a car seat. They were just strollers, not complete travel systems. I suddenly felt like the guy at the bike shop looking at the $5,000 bike, wondering why it didn't come with pedals. And that's when it hit me. This is overwhelming. There's a lot of choice when you're looking to buy something new. And a lot of us live and breathe cycling. Whether it's mountain biking or road bikes, we are armed with a lot of knowledge and expertise about what it is that we're looking for. And somebody that's just getting into the sport knows almost nothing. And so to try to figure out what type of bike you are looking for, whether it's a cross country bike, an all mountain bike, or a downhill bike is a huge choice to begin with. Then on top of that, you need to add on the details and the specifics. What types of brakes are you looking for? What wheel size are you looking for? All these little things. Are you going to add components to it? Are you going to replace certain things? This becomes a really challenging thing and a very overwhelming experience for somebody just getting into the sport. So to go back to my experience on the stroller, we decided to go back to the department store and purchase the full $300 travel system. We brought the stroller home and I put it together. Thankfully, I'm a mechanically knowledgeable person, so that wasn't too difficult. The next step was learning the controls. And you may be thinking, it's a stroller. How complicated can it be? Pushing it around, piece of cake. Folding it up to fit in your hatchback, good luck. Back at the department store, I spent easily five to 10 minutes per stroller trying to get them folded and unfolded. And again, I'm reminded to the experience of the new cyclist. We get this bike, we hope that it's right for us, and we go out for that first ride. And if we haven't done a lot of cycling, we need to figure out these controls. Shifting can be one of the most complicated things to do. We always think about it being simple. And as cyclists, it is simple. It's intuitive. We've done it for years, but it's not simple. It's quite complicated. In fact, I would argue that it's more complicated than driving a manual transmission car. When it comes to shifting gears on a bicycle, you are also working as the motor. There's the mechanism itself, the shifting of the gears, whether that's a rapid shifter like most bikes or something else like a grip shift on a kid's bike, there's that mechanical lever that you need to push or pull or rotate to get the gears to shift. But there's also some motion that you're going to make with your feet and that needs to be timed properly. If those two things aren't timed, then you're going to grind the gears or you're going to drop a chain or something's going to snap and fall off. So do I think the bike industry can do a better job of educating new cyclists? Absolutely. 
How? That's a big question and something I want to pose to you, the listener. I think that we should look outside the cycling industry for lessons on how we can be successful, how we can be more accepting and welcoming to new cyclists and mountain bikers. What changes need to be made at the bike shop level to make this happen? Now, is every bike shop like this? Absolutely not. Some are much better than others. And so let's look at the ones that are successful and understand what they're doing. So if you want to include your thoughts, you can find me on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, at Brensky Bikeski. You can also send me an email. And if you want to include your voice in a future episode, send me an audio file, brent at bikeski.ca. In past episodes, we identified the value of youth mountain bike programs. And in episode 10, I've got two guests to speak on that topic. Rocky Blondin is with the Fraser Valley Mountain Bike Association, and they run a number of youth programs getting kids in that area on bikes. And Bruce Martins is the national coach and licensing manager for the National Interscholastic Cycling Association, more commonly known as NICA. And following that, episode 11 will include my discussion with Thomas Schoen of the Caribou Mountain Bike Consortium, He'll tell us what a consortium is and why they're so helpful in developing and promoting local ride destinations. Thanks to Lee Rosevere for the song Tech Toys, and a big thanks to my wife, Jennifer Pride, for her production notes. And of course, keeping little baby Emerson quiet while I'm recording this. If you enjoy the show and haven't already, leave us a review on iTunes or whatever podcatcher you use. It helps others find the show. And finally, I'm Bren Hillier. This is Frontlines. Thanks for listening, and happy trails.